Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. We're coming to you from the Toby Family Auditorium in downtown San Francisco. Um, we are here without an audience, uh, for obvious reasons, but we have our special guest today who is joining us on our big screen here, and we'll have a great conversation for the next hour. Uh, you can find out more programs that we're doing online, most of them presented free, at commonwealthclub.org slash online. We are adding new programs pretty much every day. We've recently added Madeleine Albright. We've got a big program on nuclear, uh, stopping nuclear proliferation with George Schultz and, and uh, uh, William Perry and, and Jerry Brown coming up. Um, so find that all at commonwealthclub.org slash online. Now, I'm John Zipper. I'm the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. I'm also uh, pleased to be the co-host of the Michelle Miao Show here that takes place most Thursdays. Um, today, it actually took place twice. This is our <laughs> second show of the day. So I am now pleased to introduce the woman whose name is on the show and who is my co-host, uh, Michelle Miao. She's a producer and host of the Michelle Miao Show and also a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. So good to see you again, Michelle. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, John, and thank you for joining us. Thank you to the Commonwealth Club for providing the platform for us to have LGBTQ thought leaders and these discussions on social justice, but with an intersectional lens. <laughs> The Michelle Miao Show is also your A through Z covering the LGBT, LMNOP, and everyone in between. I just had to get that out there. <laughs> I love saying that. Our guest today, wow, I've, uh, I've wanted to speak to her for a really long time. Um, when the announcement came out that she was replacing Michael Bauer, who's the San Francisco Chronicle's longtime food critic. I, he served that role for over 30 years, I, I believe. I was shocked to find that the Chronicle had replaced, I mean, you can't replace Michael Bauer, but the position with a young, queer, intelligent woman of color uh, and in a city like San Francisco, which has been a you know, the food scene, the food capital, uh, in my opinion, in Northern California for a really long time. So, yes, our guest today, Soleil Ho, uh, who is also the former producer and host of Racist Sandwich, an award-winning podcast, which I should tell you is now the new San Francisco Chronicles food critic. And so many people were excited about the fact that she was not going to use the star system anymore, but I think are now surprised to hear her criticism on, uh, on thoughts on racism, cultural appropriation, and other hot-button topics Let's welcome Soleil to the program. Soleil, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Hey, it's API month, uh, API Heritage Month, and so I think I should start the program by congratulating you on being nominated for a James Beard Foundation Award as food critic. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it's really intimidating to be nominated for such an award during my first, essentially at the end of my first year of service. It's, it's a lot. I can't believe, I mean, wow, it's such a, an accomplishment. And we're going to talk about, you know, the journey to this accomplishment. Um, but let's go way, way back. We're joking about it and giggling. It is tradition here on the, the show that we share a coming out story. Uh, and uh, you were like, oh, well, I don't know if I remember the coming out story, but let's see if you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I've been aware uh, that I was not straight for a long time. Um, and I think I grew up around a lot of gay men too. Um, my mom was in the fashion industry. And so those are her friends. Those are the people who would hang out at our apartment in New York. Um, so it was a pretty casual thing. It wasn't like a taboo. It wasn't, you know, it was just part of life. Right. Um, so I remember when I came out to her, it was like in the car and I was just like, you know, I was in high school um, and it was just some like whatever comment like, yeah, you know, I just it'd be nice to date anybody. <laughs> and, and she was like, OK, great. So like it is the most banal, like boring coming out possible because it just didn't matter. Yeah. So it was it was kind of a letdown. That's, uh, I, I like that story, too, <laughs> because mine was so dramatic. Um, John? Um, uh, New York, I've lived in New York for a couple of years, also a great food town. Um, where did you become interested in food, potentially as a career? And was a critic kind of always the goal, or did you want to be a chef? or did, where, where, was, where did this come from? Um, well, 
you know, I grew up in just around New York, right? Um, in the city. And we would just be exposed to so many different cuisines when I was growing up. And my mom loved going to restaurants. That was so much a part of her life too, um, as someone who worked in fashion. And so she was always interested and subscribed to Gourmet and Bon Appetit and Food and Wine and all these other magazines. So they were always in the apartment. And so I would read them when I was a kid. You know, I'd read reviews. I'd read, I would read Gail Green, Ruth Reichel, like the folks that were working at the time, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, so that was kind of the base. And then after college, I graduated into the recession in 2009. Um, and I think for a lot of people in my generation, food work was the career that we were able to enter um, because jobs were so scarce. So that's where I started. I started working at a farm and then I started working in a sandwich shop. Um, and you know, from there, I just kept just pursuing a career in food. At the same time, I was writing, um, you know, when I wasn't working, I was writing like mini reviews or like little capsules for this local magazine uh, that I interned for in Minneapolis, um, which is where I lived after college. And that was kind of how I got started. I was paid like 20 bucks for a piece. Um, I'll always remember that. You mentioned something I think that uh, we don't talk a lot about, and um, I mean the the workers' rights movement has has always, has been there in the history of America, but also looking at it from the perspective of how many communities it does indeed impact: you know, immigrant community, people of color community. Um, it, for you, like, was there an incident throughout your experience in being thrown into the industry working? Uh, these types of hourly wage jobs that you felt were personally, that, that you personally felt like was, you know, injustice, for example, because I would imagine that that led to you wanting to be a little bit more outspoken with what's, what's wrong with the industry. Um, yeah, you know, I think part of it is I went to, you know, I, I went to jobs where I worked with all kinds of folks, right? People who didn't have the benefit of like even a high school education. And that didn't mean that they were less than me, right? And so like talking to them, getting to know them, having them be my friends um, really taught me that, you know, everyone, you know, this is like a basic thing, right? But like everyone deserves respect. You don't actually drop out of high school or, you know, work a menial job because you're a bad person or you're a stupid person, right? Um, so at the very, at, on a very basic level, it taught me like a broader sense of humanity than what I think we are taught in America. Um, we're, we're taught that people who are blue collar or who work wage jobs do it because they're less than, um, you know, which isn't true. They are people, they're good people, just like anyone else. Um, but the fact that they are rarely asked about their opinions, they're rarely consulted, they're rarely talked to like people uh, when we think about policy or when we even talk about like stories that matter in media, right? Um, I think that's a problem. And that was a pretty clear thing from the beginning. As someone who, you know, grew up not really critiquing food media, it was such a, you know, aspirational, wonderful thing for me when I was a kid. And then to actually work in kitchens, you know, taught me about what was missing from those stories. Over the past couple of decades, of course, you know, Food Network and, you know, the, the, the cable food, foodie channels and all that have become really big and, and of course, produce zillions of dollars. But there's also been a lot of kind of controversy over, is any of this any, actually any good? It's, you know, has that changed any of the attitudes toward the folks who are behind the scenes getting, you know, poorly paid, treated poorly, or has it just made a star out of a few, you know, celebrity uh, front people who were, you know, heading up those shows. Do you have any thoughts on those? Yeah. You know, I think, um, when we think about the people who are the most articulate or the most like media savvy or the, the cleanest looking, right. Um, as being the ones that are worth talking to, um, or putting on magazine covers or what have you, I think we're missing out on such a significant slice of humanity, right. And their perspectives, because again, it's, it's like, who becomes officers in the army, right? It's people who had the benefit of, you know, structural privilege, um, people who had schooling, people who are white or male or straight or what have you, you know, 
the problems of society echo within you know the food industry they're part and parcel of the same thing so when you think about who's actually you know processing meat in slaughterhouses who's actually doing like picking the strawberries or the tomatoes those are the folks who matter too we just don't ask them like how they feel about all of this we don't ask them and the industry always treats them as as if they don't have to because they're easily replaceable in their you know in the, right. in the industry's mind so it kind of compounds the problem let's uh talk about you know the the first assignment as food critic for the San Francisco Chronicle. I guess, you know, with the reading Michael Bauer before and whatever the food scene was through, throughout his career, um, at least in the last 10 years of his career, everything was focused on, you know, big celebrity chefs and these types of restaurants that cooked uh, uh, cultural or ethnic food, but in a, in a Amer very Americanized way, if that makes um sense for you like did, did did they tell you okay you have to go to this restaurant and continue the trend of um celebrity chef type restaurants and you know what's trendy in san francisco do you get free reign to choose whatever that restaurant was going to be well i think this job was so mm new to me because they respected my choices. It was, it was very strange. They just said, whatever you want to do, let's do it. Um, and having that kind of freedom was so different for me. So yeah, the first few, I started off with five reviews. Um, and so those first five are restaurants that I chose, but had conversations about because we knew how important it would be to debut with like a nice spread of places that were pretty representative of like what approach I would be taking for the next however long. Um, so yeah, that, that was, it was a collaboration, I guess. Like I had proposals and then they said yes or whatever, but there was no like executive guiding of what I was doing and still really isn't. There's suggestions sometimes um, cause I think they still wanna know like what I think about the French laundry, but you know, um, that's for later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's talk about just the, the because there, God, we could spend an entire hour just talking about the the act of going to review a, re a restaurant, whether they know who you are and such. You, you mentioned Ruth Reichel and how she was famous, of course, for wearing a disguise for many years so when she would go to uh, review a place. Um, you're here. We're assuming this is your real, uh, real video of you. Um, <laughs> do you assume that when you go into a restaurant, they already know you're there for a review. And do you think that affects how they treat you? I don't. I mean, it depends on the restaurant too, right? Like a lot of immigrant owned restaurants, they don't, don't care. You know, they don't read the food section. They have no idea what a food critic is. Um, and those are the sorts of restaurants I also go to, right? So there's a mix, right, of reactions. If I go to a place like the French Laundry, I assume they know. Although last time I went, they didn't know, which is very funny. Um, so, you know, like there are places where it's people's jobs to spot people like me. Right. That is like a whole position to have a dossier on all the critics. Um, but there are other places that, you know, where that just doesn't even register for them. Um, but, you know, the first like month or so when I started, People, people would write to me and ask like, hey, did I see you at this one sushi place on Thursday? Um, which wasn't a thing that happened. So I, I think I could take some solace in knowing there are a lot of Asian women who eat out in the Bay Area who might look kind of like me. Um, so it spreads it out a bit. So what is it, you, I mean, I mentioned it in the introduction introduction i mean people were excited that the star system will go away and then maybe we're surprised by how uh thoughtful you know your reviews actually are and covering many different layers of of food uh, when you're sitting there and you're you're tasting food you're ordering and you're thinking about this restaurant and i mean what what goes into the criticism like what how do you, do people think, okay, if you're a food critic, you're sitting there and you're tasting stuff and it's whether you like it or you don't, but obviously right. that's not the case with you. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a difference, right? Between is this well done? Um, is this badly done? And do I like it or do I not like it? I think those are two very different, you know, spectrums, right? Um, and so being able to separate that personal preference thing from the overall like evaluation of how things are going, I think is 
kind of the hard part, right? That's the task of a critic. Um, so for me, the important thing is contextualization, right? So like how, when I walk into a restaurant um, and I try to interpret like what all of this means, right? Like what does this food mean? Why is the wall this color, right? Why are the servers wearing that outfit? Um, who is in this room and who's not in this room? Like all of this is part of the picture. And so trying to paint that picture and describe it, put it to words so that people can understand what's going on, right? Um, that's the fun part of the job. So it's almost like literary analysis or like film analysis, right? Like you could watch a movie and not think about it. Like you could eat a, a, a pizza and not think about it, but just thinking about it is the fun part. And what reaction do you get from readers? Because obviously that was a change from probably what they were expecting from a food critic. So has it been positive, negative, a lot of both? A lot of both. You know, um, I think there's certainly people who miss the stars because I think the stars were like the easiest kind of shorthand. It is, no, do I go or not? And, you know, a lot of people are very functional in their food reading and that's fine. Um, but other people were really excited to have that kind of writing. So, you know. I am a matter of taste, I guess. Well, the, I think you know what John might also be alluding to is the the parts where the responses might be a little, uh, uh, I don't know, I don't know what's the right word for it, but I do know that I've read people's, you know, just annoyed maybe that uh, you're 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 doing a deeper analysis of the food, and so some of the responses call you a, a, you know controversial. And and we kind of had an email exchange of that, like if that was even described of your reviews as controversial. Like, what does that even mean? Because you talk about some real stuff, so you know, so society's issues. And uh, yeah, would love to hear how it makes you feel when people say you you know you're you're controversial or, or the way that you review food is controversial. Well, I mean it's kind of, it's, you know, it, it's weird for me, right? Because it's um, kind of my mission or a mission, right? Like, I don't know. But like, part of what I really deeply believe in is that everything matters, right? Um, everything we do, every choice we make, every, you know, item we decorate our homes with, or everything we wear is sending a message, um, either consciously or subconsciously. That's just a part of how things work, right? Um, that's taste essentially is like we broadcast our personalities and our level of education and our uh, feelings about society and ourselves like through the things that we adorn ourselves with or the things we read or whatever and food is part of that you know um, and I think the messages that it sends whether highbrow lowbrow um, low class high class whatever I think are worth talking about and pretending that those aren't actually a factor or even a part of that conversation I think is actively denying a huge part of why we do anything you know um this is how we slot into society this is how like this is why we make the choices that we make so what i'm trying to do is not introducing politics into food i think that's a kind of misconception but from my perspective i'm exposing what is already there that we just actively deny because we just don't want to think about it which is fine you don't have to think about it but like don't be mad that i'm making you think mm. <laughs> When you walk into a restaurant, whether you're a reviewer or not, maybe it's two separate answers here, but what do you, what makes you happy when you see it? What, what, when you experience it, what are the things that you look for? They're just like this. I like, you know, I really, as I get older, I really cherish comfortable chairs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I won't ding a place for having them or not having them, but when I see them, I get excited, which is a very, I don't know, maybe an old lady thing to say, but you know, I'll, I'll be excited to sit. That feels good. I'm right there with you. When I go into a place and they've got benches, I'm just like, does no one here have a back problem? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about, you know, food and um, yes, let's, let's do that. <laughs> let's, let's make ourselves hungry. No, but <laughs> in, in all seriousness, you know, the immigrant community, um, low income working class community have found ways to share food uh, and also have it be a part of making money and survival. Uh, so there's there's food in that way when you know you're eating for sustenance. And then 
then there's food that gets glamorized and uh, becomes like, you know, trendy, especially in today's time when you have social media and influencers on Instagram. And so I wanted to hear your thoughts about, you know, the changing San Francisco landscape and the very big, wide gap between food that we have available um, for the working class and then food that is there for the really wealthy, the very rich that exists in San Francisco. Which, by the way, I, I do recognize that San Francisco in itself is going through a huge major change with a lot of these restaurants um, not being able to survive the economic, you know, uh, the envi economic environment before COVID-19, and then we'll see what happens after. Oh, that's a huge question. Um, but what I, knew you'd, I, you'd, you'd be, yeah, I knew you were the only one who could answer that and entertain <laughs> my wild, wacky thoughts. <laughs> I mean, they're not wacky. Um, I think the writer, Mickey Kendall, put it really well when she talks about um, food gentrification. I think that's a, a wonderful way of thinking about it. You know, it, like conceptually, I think it's helpful for people who, you know, on a baseline understand what gentrification is, but don't really know how to apply these and, you know, thinking about inequity to food. So with gentrification, right, like a neighborhood, people live in this neighborhood, but they get priced out once that neighborhood becomes trendy, right? Like the housing stock and just quality of life stuff really isn't available to them anymore. Um, and then they have to leave and find something else. So with food, you have the same thing, right? When you think about like oxtail, for instance, as an ingredient, really popular among immigrant communities, especially people um, in the American South, also uh, in the West Indies, people you know, who are trying to make do with very little, they get this very like unpopular cut of meat and cook it for a long time and make really delicious curries or stews or whatever. Um, but when oxtail gets trendy, right, when, you know, a restaurant in town serves it and then it gets picked up in the media and then, you know, um, home cooks of all backgrounds want to cook it, that cut of meat becomes more popular, more expensive, less available. And so the people who originally ate it, right, um, can't find it. And then what do they do? Like, what do they eat for their protein? Um, so that question, right, of who gets to cook food, who gets to eat food, who gets to own food is very tied to gentrification. Um, it's an easy way to think about it anyway. So, so yeah, there's that. But then there's also this tension uh, with the idea that we don't pay enough for food, that food is already so heavily subsidized by you know, the government, um, as far as, you know, corn and soy and wheat and beef, um, you know, and those flood the market and cause a lot of, you know, certain kinds of food being more popular among the working class that aren't necessarily great for your body. Um, and, you know, that's a big structural thing that's adding to, you know, let's say the proliferation of McDonald's and like burgers and fast food being like the thing that you can eat, right? Um, so there's that, and then there's the food gentrification thing. At the same time, um, a lot of immigrant-owned restaurants aren't able to charge the food or charge the prices for the food that they're making because people expect them to be cheap, because they're serving their communities, right, who don't necessarily have a ton of money. So you, you know, if a place charges 20 bucks for a plate of tacos, like that's just, you know, there's riots, right? People get mad. They're, they get really nasty on social media and Yelp or whatever. And it's almost like um, an, like charging them with being like uppity or pretentious or you know above their station for doing such a thing. But at the same time, if you want to pay healthcare, you want to pay people fair wages, you want to pay rent in a place like San Francisco, maybe those prices are appropriate, right? So there's, again, this like really, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, and a lot of stuff plays out on the restaurant scene that I think is a microcosm of these huge structural things that are happening, right? People don't have enough money as a baseline, right? People aren't able to access food or housing or the neighborhoods that they should be able to. That's another factor. And then, you know, people don't have health care. <laughs> that's another huge factor. And like all of this plays out. So maybe that's a little convoluted, but that is uh, essentially like what's behind a lot of these like micro debates about price and about food and accessibility. Uh, going off a bit of what Michelle was saying, as well as there's a question from one of our viewers asking to kind of predict or, or what do you see will happen with the restaurant 
uh, I don't want to say community, the restaurant industry, restaurants in the city, uh, as a, specifically as a result of this shutdown. Mm. And, and include, maybe get into, you know, well, are those, you know, are the, those small immigrant run restaurants going to be less likely, more likely to be able to reopen? Are they going to be able to find staff? You know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Because this, uh, we were talking before the program, I think the Golden Gate Restaurant Association predicted at least 50% of the restaurants that have closed because of COVID will not likely reopen. So what, how, what do you think is going to change and who will it hit? Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. And uh, <laughs> I've done a lot of reading about policy in the past month or so just to keep up with all, you know, things are changing all the time. And Congress is passing new things all the time um, and changing the sort of um, the things that they're supplying with business owners. So <clears throat> I think that the restaurant industry is pretty screwed actually, um, they're not being helped. And I think that is, you know, the, the logical end point to this is that we're gonna get a lot more um, of these empty spaces being filled by chains, places that have a lot of money in the bank that are able to fill those spaces and are able to survive this because they, you know, they're able, they have the benefit of being a part of a huge group. Um, so I think that the immigrant owned restaurants and the restaurants that are owned by people of color, especially are not being served by federal aid right now. Um, you know, I think they're the majority of people who received that first wave of uh, small business administration loans have not been people of color or uh, female business owners or anyone, you know, like that who might not have a ton of money in the bank. Um, <clears throat> and also the restrictions on the paycheck protection program, which you know, that's the money that's available um, on the loans that they're, you know, supplying with folks are super restrictive, right? So for instance, that you have to pay, I think 75% of that loan has to go to payroll and 25% can go to the rest. And if you don't do that, then the portion of the loan that's forgivable shrinks. Um, so people are going to be out more money <laughs> by participating in this thing if they, their business model doesn't fit that. And most restaurants, their business model does not fit that. Um, so that, you know, the aid that should be for restaurants just isn't there, which means a lot of these places are going on their own, maybe closing. Um, you know, I think the restaurants that are going to be sort of at the ends of their leases, you're already seeing like classic restaurants like start to close, right? What we consider to be old time places. Um, maybe it's not worth it to stay that one last year on their lease and maybe it's just time to cut bait and run, right? Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on that essentially just makes it really hard for restaurants to reopen right now. Um, the fact that there's no vaccine, right? Like how can diners or even restaurant essential workers, right? Uh, trust that they're gonna be safe when they go out there. There's a lot that's happening. And, you know, I think restaurants are kind of the canary in the coal mine here where, you know, it indicates, their trouble indicates so much deeper trouble with like how we arrange things um, economically. How has it impacted what you do? Uh, I think I saw on your Instagram that uh, you had some tacos birria uh, delivered from the chef to your house. Uh, I don't know if that was part of an actual review, but yeah, are you are you reviewing food at this time, or kind of you know being a part of what we're all going through with COVID and and uh, uh, just addressing and talking about COVID? I feel like that's that's all we talk about. Yeah, I mean, I think I've been doing some takeout stories. Um, I have one coming out tomorrow uh, about places that I've called in. And so that's been a part of it. And, you know, just acknowledging the places that are still working and trying to get good food out, I think is important. Um, and also writing about policy and writing about what's going on with the restaurant industry. So I've been more of a reporter these days as well. So, yeah, I mean... It's a mix. Uh, the papers let me do some movie reviews too, which is fun, just to keep me busy. One of our viewers uh, writes that she's a vegan and she appreciates the fact that you pay attention to vegan-friendly foods and such. And and she asks if uh, you would, you know, ever like focus one column a week or whatever on vegan restaurants or vegan meals. Yeah. So um, I usually try to to order like a vegan or vegetarian dish whenever I go out, um, in addition to whatever else. And, you know, last year I dedicated 
every review for the month of October to vegan restaurants or vegan establishments. Um, I got a lot of complaints about it. <laughs> um, so it maybe starts keeping it to a month feels good, but yeah, like just having it not be an exceptional thing and just talking about, you know, vegetable plant-based options is always, you know, a part of what I want to do. It might have, it might be kind of a thing that we're going to going to need with a lot of the, the meat processing plants clo closing down and lack of meat available. You, you know, there's just so much going on. There's so much that we could ask you. I want to ask you about, um, uh, you know, cultural appropriation in food and, and it, it, uh, my, my family refugees from Laos. And for me, like, you know, Lao food was definitely not pop popular growing up and, and eating sticky rice with salt was, is kind of like a way to survive. And so then coming to San Francisco, going on dates and people are like, Oh, I'm going to take you to Thai food and seeing sticky rice served as a decadent dessert was kind of like a, th this is so wrong. Like you can't charge $12 for this. And this is back in, in 2000. And not that that's appropriation, but it just was, um, in my mind, you know, when, when the food isn't necessarily celebrated in its authentic form is when I start to have these thoughts of, is it appropriation or is it not? And it, and there's so much arguing back and forth with people about this. So you're, you're the only, one of the only few people that we can have an honest conversation about food and cultural appropriation and what the heck is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's something that I've certainly had a lot of evolving feelings about. I think, you know, when I started thinking about it um, back in 20, God, I don't know, 2013 or so, right? Um, it, the cultural appropriation was primarily what we used to talk about, like, for instance, people wearing Native American war bonnets to Coachella, like that sort of thing, right? Like, you're appropriating this cultural object in a context that is like completely not appropriate, right? Um, so thinking about it in terms of food has been pretty interesting and different. I think at this point, right? Cause, cause you can, you can go into thinking about like, oh, well, like you can't make this or, you know, I can't make that, right? Because mm -hmm. that's appropriation. Um, but appropriation in itself is not a bad thing. It is a thing that people, you know, sociologists or anthropologists use to, to describe the sharing of, you know, cultural behaviors, right? And the spreading of those behaviors. Um, you know, taking one thing out of its context, uh, you know, is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's the part where it gets kind of, you know, dicey is when we realize that we are a part of society, that like <laughs> we don't exist in a vacuum. There are hierarchies, there are power differentials that make appropriation really, you know, complicated and difficult to wrangle. So for me, the most helpful question to ask in these sorts of debates is where's this money going? Mm. You know? Who's getting the credit? Who's getting the money? And whose labor is getting compensated fairly? Um, and if the answers to those questions are not necessarily people for whom, like you know, if they have a stake in this, like a real cultural identity stake in this, then you know, it, let's talk about it, you know, and let's, let's see what's going on. Um, but you know, I think so often, I think the writer Ijeoma Oluo talks about this too, where so often the debate about appropriation is. Uh, just asking for permission. It's people who say, you know, I want to make curry, please make this okay for me. And that's not the point of this, you know, that's a distraction. Um, make your curry, it's fine. But more like, let's talk about power. That's the point of this, right? But like being, mm, being distracted from that conversation is not productive or helpful. I, my, my best example is the guy, the chef, uh, the American chef who went to Asia came back and um, trademark pho <laughs> or tried to trademark pho um, and open up a bunch of restaurants, uh, pho restaurants. And so that didn't go very well, as you can imagine. John. Uh, that's a big, I'm sorry, I was looking at my, my questions from the audience, so I'm a little flustered. Um, <laughs> Why, I'll, I'll just put out the question that I know people have asked, why should someone who's just looking for a good meal care about power differentials and not 
you know, I mean, I, I, so I can see one thing that, yes, I want, I think everyone in that restaurant should be paid well. They shouldn't have to worry about, you know, where they're, how they're, where they're going to get their rent money and all that kind of stuff. But beyond that, why, why, why should that person care? I mean, you know, paraphrase one of my favorite headlines of the past couple of years is I don't know how to make you care about other people. But right, and but, I think. But, the but at the same time, other people. It's it's an intrinsic, right? Like you are inherently connected to other people. The obligations that we hold to other people are something that we actively can ignore sometimes. And I think part of what I'm trying to do is just reintroduce those connections. And you don't necessarily have to, you know, be anxious all the time when you go out to eat or think really hard about everything that's going on, right? Like sometimes you just want to watch cats. Right. Sometimes you just want to watch a popcorn movie and not care about anything. And that's fine. You know, I just think that sometimes just making those connections is a really important part of just participating in society. Like that's a personal belief that I have. Um, but I'm not and by any means asking anyone to think just like me. Do you still prefer um, Vietnamese food in a in a traditional way or do you change it up? every now and then, and, and we'll have contemporary, super modern. I mean, if, if this is not working, this is Soleil at home or hanging out with friends. Like if you had to choose between the fancy banh mi sandwich or the, you know, the, 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 uh, the OG stuff this is what I'm talking about. Like the, the $2 and 50 cent banh mi sandwich and the tenderloin. Um, what, yeah. Like, how do you prefer it? Um, I don't really, I'm not really an authenticity chaser by any means. Um, I'm always interested in seeing what people are trying and trying to figure out. Um, Cause you know, I grew up with old school Vietnamese food and that's fine. But then actually realizing down the road as I grew older that the food that I understood to be Vietnamese, you know, um, was actually a very particular slice of the cuisine, right? It was Southern Vietnamese, it was pre 1970s, and that was the food, right? And realizing that the cuisine of the actual country of Vietnam has changed drastically since then, I think was a wake up call to me to think like, okay, like we are actually, by pinning the kind of label of authenticity on certain kinds of foodstuffs, we're, you know, we're talking about a specific time and place that is in our own heads, right? That is very much tied to nostalgia. So yeah, I mean, I'm not ever going to fault anything for wanting to be different or change and I'm open to all things. I have a friend who, uh, she and her wife lived in Kansas. They weren't from there, but I mean, they, they were living there at the time and they, they really liked Mexican food. And then they moved out to Portland and they went around looking for a Mexican restaurant that they would really like. And they just kept going there. Well, that's a good place, but it's just not what we really, really like. They'd go try another one. And it, it took them a long time before they realized, Oh, it wasn't actually Mexican food. They liked, they liked kind of, the Tex-Mex, just the mixture of the cultures and the foods that was there, um, in which I, 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 I appreciated what she was saying, which was that, you know, just realizing that sometimes that mixture is what she really goes for, and it certainly wasn't a rejection of, you know, one culture or one food. It was just finding yeah. what really hit her palate. Yeah, I, 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 I feel the same way in some, some uh, cuisines and then some that are especially near and dear, I really get dramatic about it. I, I got to stop that. I, I mean, because I love food. I love food. Give so, examples. Give examples. What's that? Give examples. Oh, well, I mean, you know, the Im ex emergence, explosion of Southeast Asian food. So growing up, you know, people made fun of me for eating fish sauce or, you know, it smells, it's funky or like papaya salad actually made uh, authentically. And I'll, I'll put that up in air quotes because depending on, how you like it and how you create it. That's your original, you know, creation, right? But it's supposed to be funky. It's from, it's like a, a fermented fish paste that's like 10 times more than what you get in the bottle. They call it badak and um, it smells and, and it's, but it's really spicy, but I love it so much. So the other day I go to a, 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 fa a Thai restaurant and they charge me $2 extra to have it the original way to use the <laughs> badak and, um, I was so I was so angry, you know, and I, and it got all political about dinner, and, and 
made my my wife angry. Um, but that's what I'm talking about is that that's why it was so exciting to talk to you because I kind of feel like this is this is therapy for me and to finally get back to, you know, it's okay to be political about food, but it's also okay to enjoy it as well. So let's, um, let's talk about San Francisco and, and food and some of the places that have been treasures for you. Uh, I also, what I love about your reviews and you're putting lots of places on the map that people might not have uh, known or they, you know, or have been forgotten. Um, so if you could just name just a couple of your own personal treasures. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I think one of my favorite places to review has been, um, gosh, Swan Oyster Depot. Um, just because it's so, I mean, right. Like nobody doesn't know about that place. It's very typical and it. I was a little embarrassed when I first started going there because I thought, okay, like this is such a touristy thing to do. And I'm, everyone's going to think I'm not cool because I love this place, but like, it, it's actually really cool. Right. Um, one of my favorite things is when I go out and I'm surprised, you know, and like that really surprised me just how, you know, <laughs> I, I generally don't love like very masculine spaces. It's not my favorite thing in the world, but like for some reason that one where like, everyone but one person is a man right behind the counter um it was really homey and it was really good and the 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 vibe of generosity in that space was so nice um it made me feel really welcomed and i think another place i really enjoyed was um there's this burmese spot in fremont actually just going to fremont itself was like so wonderful for me i really like that town um and this Burmese place called Jain Jain, which is spelled K-Y-A-I-N, K-Y-A-I-N. Um, I was taken there by a friend named Omar, and he loves that place. And just to, to actually experience, you know, viscerally how, um, how much he loved that place and like what it meant to him. And also to really enjoy the food and the vibe. It was so like, I guess I just really like homey places, right? Um, and it's such a, a great hot spot for the local Burmese community. It was just a really good feeling, right? I like that kind of stuff. Awesome. John? Uh, someone in the audience asks, um, during the shutdown, would you consider writing profiles of family-owned restaurants with their advice on preparing great food at home? Hmm. Um, that's an idea. I'll take it to our editor. <laughs> and uh, you get that a lot people writing into you and saying why don't you write about xyz <laughs> yeah you know um i think they're always written with the best intentions and you know stories get written or don't get written for all kinds of reasons but you know i'm always taking new ideas your most recent um post actually wasn't a, a food review but it was about your relationship with your sister yeah yeah did you already read it wow that was fast <laughs> Well, you know, I, what I loved about it, I mean, you still include, it's it's like you, you know, you uh, going there um, to support your sister, having her first baby, but you're talking about food still. And, and I'm thinking about all these dishes that you thought, you know, you were going to make. So do you have like a chef, you know, it sounds like you, you cook really great meals for your, at home and, and you do you consider yourself a chef, a, a good cook? Well, um, I've worked in restaurants for almost a decade as a cook um, and sometimes a chef. So I have that background professionally. And so at home, you know, traditionally I would work nights. I wouldn't really have time to make food at home and would usually just eat kind of garbage. <laughs> um, but, you know, now that I'm just a full-time writer, I have more time to cook, which is wonderful. And now I have a lot of time to cook. So when you go to someone else's house and they're cooking for you, are they nervous? Are they afraid how you're going to react? <laughs> <laughs> Do they think, oh, no, it's got to be perfect? Or I mean, I don't think I come off as that mean. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, you know, sometimes people are nervous, but it's, you know, silly. What's a must-have, like, it, it, you know, as a food ingredient, like, in your pantry? Mm. Um, I really, really, really like fish sauce. Um, I think I have like four bottles in my pantry right now of different like brands and different like salinities. 
Um, cause they all have different, you know, purposes, but I really like to put it in guacamole. <laughs> Is there a food that you don't like that you wish you could like, or wish you did like? Um, actually, yeah. Tripe. I wish I liked it, but okay. I have a hard time with it. Why do you wish that you, <laughs> cause I don't like tripe, <laughs> I don't like tripe, but, but, uh, but I know, you know, my family eats a lot of, a, a lot of tripe and they, they love everything about it. The, you know, the texture, it's fun to eat. It's a mild taste. Um, but wh what is it for you? For me, it's, yeah, it's the visual is the texture. Yeah, it's that. Um, <laughs> I, I'm pretty open to most foods, but that's why I just like, I, I want to be open, <laughs> but for some reason I just had this block with tripe. Have your tastes changed as, as throughout your life? Because I know there are some, like when I was a little kid, my poor mother, I would take out onions from every little thing. It didn't matter if it was a hamburger or whatever. I would pick out all the onions. It would drive her crazy. I now put onions into just about everything I, I cook. Have, have you noticed changes in your taste over the years? Yeah. Well, kids are really sensitive, right? Especially to bitter flavors. So like peppers and onions, you know, they just, they don't like it because, you know, they don't want to be poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. Uh, when I was a kid, yeah, I was very, very picky, actually. Um, I was really into hot dogs and cheese pizza and I would eat pho, but only noodles and broth. I wouldn't eat it with anything else. So that was, I remember that period and it was not a, not, not cute. <laughs> 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 um going back to the pandemic is as we uh, you know wind, wind down i'd love to hear your thoughts i mean so many people are trying to figure out you know what happens next um so i don't know if you're getting any any insider news or tips or what people are thinking of how we support the restaurant community especially in the bay area once we're able to go out um but do you, are you hearing anything like what pe what restaurant owners are are thinking of how we might be able to get back into dining again? I think by and large, everyone's really conservative um, and they're predicting a lot of conservative behavior from diners just because, again, there's no vaccine. There's no guarantee that this isn't, isn't coming back. And I think a lot of our, you know, colleagues in East Asia, for instance, are pretty much they've accepted that it's going to come back like a wildfire almost. And, you know, I think the more prepared we are for that eventuality, I think the better situated we'll be. I think I'm hearing that from a lot of restaurant owners and a lot of workers as well. And, you know, it doesn't look promising as far as the protections that are granted to us as citizens or business owners or whatever by our governments. Um, the fact that healthcare is still contingent on employment is really discouraging just because people have many, many, many millions of people have lost their jobs and now they don't have health care, right? So to even get tested or have the care that they need or even just have their funerals paid for, right, is an impossibility. So it's not looking great. And I think people are really hesitant to make predictions about the economy coming back or anything coming back. I think the before, generally I'm hearing before is over. We're never going back to before. Um, well, what comes next is very contingent on the political will of a lot of the people in charge to make that less bad than it could be. Do you think that, uh, at least in San Francisco, I know that there had been a lot of voices, a lot of pressure out there for local leaders to change a little, you know, a little bit of the, the red tape that was really heavily impacting uh, restaurants, like it's just becoming way too costly to run a restaurant in, in San Francisco. Um, and there's part of me that's hopeful that at least maybe the local leaders here will think about in some, some way, maybe this will force them to change all of that and make it a lot easier for people to continue doing business or as retailers. But I, I know it all leads us to this one answer that we've all been sharing, which is I'm not sure I don't know. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, another huge factor in this, too, is just the lack of protections or any sort of insurance for undocumented workers who are the backbone of the food industry, you know, from slaughterhouses to fields to restaurants. And the fact that they're not being taken care of or given a path to citizenship or any access to unemployment insurance or health insurance is, I think, a huge part of why so many restaurants and other businesses are just kind of 
forcing them, forcing themselves to stay open or doing GoFundMe's or really struggling to to continue along because they want to take care of those people in their community, but they can't, right? Like the government won't take care of them. So they have to, but like, they're not able to because no one wants to get takeout or, you know, it's just, it's a mess. Um, so there's these huge systemic things that need to be fixed in order for anyone to be comfortable um, with, I mean, in order for us to achieve any semblance of what had been before. I mean, if we even want it at this point. If scarcity, you know, I think for a lot of people, scarcity of the food that was available to them has been a part of their lives before COVID, right? Um, I think that's just going to spread to more and more communities um, who might not be used to that. But I think there's a lot to learn from these strategies for preserving and pickling and just like batch cooking and sharing with your community that I think a lot of immigrant communities and working class communities have already like known about and done pretty fantastically, right? Um, Maybe you see it with all the people who are getting into bread baking right now. Uh, one thing that I find really funny is just the competitiveness of, of home cooking is still a factor. Um, even during an outbreak, you know, people are posting all these glorious pictures of bread or like focaccia with like vegetables arranged like gardens. And I just like, so humans are very much the same. So I think that's really funny. Do you watch any uh, uh, food travel shows at all? Um especially the the youtubers no they make me tired i can't <laughs> wait can we stay on that though why do they make you so tired i mean because you're like the professional critic you're you know this is you're the real deal uh, if i were any any restaurant I'd want you to really tell me about my food and my process but there's so many people who just pick up a camera and they have the means to go to thailand or or you know egypt and then they eat something and and they're just like this is so good yeah i mean the main difference that i see between myself and my colleagues and folks like them is that um, generally speaking right you can trust that i'm not being paid by the place the restaurant or what have you to write something nice about them you know what I mean? Like I am held to account by very strict ethics considerations. I asked my boss before any, like anything that might be like even touching an ethics breach, like happens just to make sure. Um, but these other folks, you know, you see these reports from restaurateurs or cooks or whatever, where they are being es essentially like exploited, right. Or, um, for, for good coverage by these folks, like by influencers or video people or whatever. And I think that's really messed up. It's really mm -hmm. sad. And just for a lot of them, that might be the way they get the coverage they need, but like, it's, ex I don't know, it's extortion. And I don't really ever want to co-sign that. You've mentioned having worked as a cook or chef. Um, did you ever want to open your own place? And if so, what would it be? Um, I have in the past, I've wanted to open my own place and I actually helped my mom open a restaurant back in Mexico where she lives. Um, and that was fun. It was, <laughs> it was really intense. I had to learn all these ingredients, names in Spanish <laughs> so I could actually order them. Um, but my own restaurant, mm, I think at this point, no, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it to the professionals. <laughs> um, we uh, are, you know, I'm trying to collect my final questions because I've waited so long to, to talk to you. And I was, when I first reached out, I was nervous. I was like, <laughs> oh, she says yes. Um, but truly, I'm so glad that we did this in the month of May and doing it during API Heritage Month and wanting to share with the world you know, this incredible person in our community that we can be, we are super proud of. You know, opened up the fact that you nominated for a James Beard Award for your work. And after one year, <laughs> so we didn't really get into it. But I mean, your your mom must be super proud. Um, your friends, your family, you. How do you feel about it? Um, I feel like I'm probably going to lose. <laughs> Just because I'm up against these two veterans, right? Um, so yes, being nominated is great. You know, to paraphrase uh, Sandra Oh, I'm just proud. I'm honored to be Asian. <laughs> I think that's great. Um, and yeah, it, it's unbelievable. Just the fact that, you know, the year before it was 
um, it was Bill Addison, it was Pete Wells, it was Jonathan Gold in that category. And just, again, to be included with all these veterans, these people who I've looked up to for a long time, it's just such an honor. Michelle mentioned you had done uh, the Racist Sandwich podcast. Uh, are you doing podcasts now still? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're going to be launching a podcast through The Chronicle, actually, um, with myself and with Justin Phillips, who's also a food reporter. Um, and yeah, it'll be going up at the end of June, and I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, so let's let's share the love. Who are some of the film or film critics? Who are some of the food critics that uh, you respect that you you think people should also check out? Well, I think when I started, it was such an amazing moment, right? Because California got a bunch of new critics all at once. Um, the LA Times and then New York Times sent a critic out here specifically for California coverage, and then it was me. Um, and the folks that I entered with, I think I just love and respect so much. And that's Patricia Escarcega, Bill Addison, and Tejal Rao, right? And like of note too is that California got three women of color critics all at once, um, which is amazing and so historic and so fun. And we chat all the time and it's great. <laughs> Even though we're technically rivals, but who cares? Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I love the work that they do. I think it's fantastic. And there's of course, like other writers who aren't necessarily food critics that I love, like Alicia Kennedy, um, who works out of San Juan, Puerto Rico, um, Mayuk Sen, who works out of New York, and actually, um, my gosh, there's just so many. I, like, we, we're all, all the food writers and food critics that you know, we all like talk in group chats and like Twitter DMs all the time. And it's just like, there's so many people who are just wonderful. And yeah, it's such a great community. Will we see you as a guest judge on a food show in the future? Uh, I, I just hate food shows. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I really, really like you. Um, I wish that I could hang out and be best friends. And so if we were like able to hang out and, and Netflix together during a pandemic, what's, uh, what are some of your recommendations? Well, um, Let's see. <laughs> I I really loved watching actually Moonstruck with a couple of friends a few uh, days ago. That was really lovely. Um, I don't think that's on Netflix, but that was a good one. Um, I've been watching a lot of Terrace House too. That's kind of my jam at the moment, which is this like reality show where nothing happens. Um, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, that kind of is, stuff. This is a true test if we could really be best friends. Did you watch Tiger King? I didn't. No, I, you know, it takes me like six months to watch whatever's trendy. Like, and I also hear that like the ethics of the production were really awful. And like, there's a trans person in this, in this series that's repeatedly misgendered. And I just like, don't want any part of it. This is so awesome. This is great. <laughs> and the yeah, Best um, part of, you know, my day. Well, we've, we've been spending all morning and doing the show. Um, John, I'll let you, you have a couple questions before I ask my very last question. Oh my. See, yeah, most of what I want to get into is, is really just how uh, kind of the mechanics of what you do, because it's, it, it's, it's one of those neat jobs that everyone kind of has access to the end product of, but <laughs> you know, lots of people have a clergy person in their family or a doctor or a teacher or a, a, maybe a, a waiter or whatever. Almost no one I know has a food critic in their family or even their circle of friends. So um, talk a little bit about how, when, when you, 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 you said earlier, when you started at the, this with the Chronicle, you wrote five pieces. Were those like kind of trial pieces or was that you were hired and, and those are your first five that you were referring to? Um, it's when I was hired and then the first things that I had published through okay. the Chronicle. So, so how did you get hired? How did... Did you approach them? You, you knew, did they advertise for Michael Bauer? Were you already on their radar? Well, you know, when Michael announced his retirement, that was huge news in the food writing world, right? Um, he had been in the position for 32, 33 years, I believe. Um, and just that's a big deal. Um, and so we were all chattering about, like, who was going to replace him? Like, who was going to be the new San Francisco critic? Um, and I certainly had my list of hopefuls that I wanted to be in the role, too. Um, I didn't think to apply actually until people, 
And so other people were saying that like I would be a front runner or like I know the Washington Post put out a story about like the possible people for the role, including Tajel and me. And I hadn't even applied yet. And I was like, oh, I guess I should. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, I guess I literally just uploaded my LinkedIn page to the Hearst Corporation website and things started happening from there. It was it was pretty wild. Wow. That's so cool. Well, we're lucky to have you. And uh, I think we're, whatever happens after or during this pandemic, um, you'll, you're a, you'll go down in history, a voice that keeps us alive and keeps us nourished and keeps us thinking, even if we're enjoying our food. So the last question for you is, um, you know, for, for, the, for the people, I get, it's so courageous to do what you do, do what you love, and then speak up when it might not be the most popular thing. So what keeps you going? What keeps you driven to do what you do? I just say it, but I really get a lot out of when people reach out to me individually and just tell me that they liked something that I wrote. <laughs> like I'm very praise driven. So <laughs> um, getting praise actually has been very helpful as a way to, cause it's easy for me to fixate on the bad stuff, right? And the hate mail and the, sometimes I get harassed or whatever. Um, and you know, the human brain is wired such that like, that's what you fixate on. That's what you remember and the nice stuff, not necessarily, right? So when people say nice stuff to me, I really, I have to try really hard to integrate that and accept it, um, but it's very helpful. Soleil, thank you so much for joining us here on the program and uh, for being the San Francisco Chronicles food critic. And we look forward to your next column. Thank you. John, take it away. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, here at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, we hope you have a good rest of your week and a good weekend. You can find out more programs at commonwealthclub.org online.